So the other um, agent that can be used uh, in this disease is ruxolitinib, based on the results of the response one and response two trials. These were patients with hydroxyurea intolerance or hydroxyurea resistance, um, basically by ELN guidelines that was defined. And both studies, one was in a study of patients with splenomegaly, one, response one, one in uh, response two was without splenomegaly, but they both showed the same thing, a um, statistically significant decrease in phlebotomy requirements, higher rates of complete hematologic remission. Um, so I've summarized those studies, but you know, one thing I just didn't mention was improvement in symptoms couldn't be shown because it wasn't a blinded study. Um, and so it didn't go into the FDA label, but I'm gonna bring this back to you, Robin. Um, you mentioned earlier how patients who receive cytoreductive therapy with hydroxyurea may continue to have quite a burden of symptoms, despite ruxolitinib not being approved in PV based on symptoms control. Is this something that you go to in, in PV, everything else being equal? I, I do. I have to admit when I see patients, especially if they've tried interferon or hydroxyurea and haven't done well with it uh, because of their symptom burden, I, I do like to go to ruxolitinib and I certainly have seen symptom responses with ruxolitinib that you, you don't see with interferon or with hydrea. In fact, actually, I think that as much as I think it's extremely promising data with interferon, say one of its huge caveats is the idea that a large portion of patients won't be able to tolerate the drug because of the flu-like effects. So I think that uh, especially for the highly symptomatic patients who may have already tried a first-line therapy, ruxolitinib is a second line for symptom burden improvement and quality of life improvement. I think it's a very reasonable thing. We have, in the UK, had several investigator-led studies when they're all under the umbrella of MAGIC, but ET and, and PV. So we've had a, an experience of using ruxolitinib versus best available therapy in these groups of patients for a prolonged period of time, no crossover. And certainly in, or in, in PV, you see a group of patients getting a very major symptom response. And in fact, from the clinical experience, you can almost define the patient that is likely to do well on ruxolitinib um, as a second line agent. And we would now, from time to time, we have difficulties with accessing drugs, but requesting it on somebody who has a particular problem, in my book, with the really bad itch uh, and sweats, the, the, it's life transforming in some of these patients. It's often interesting to me the disconnect between trial eligibility and um, um, agency approval of, of drugs. So in the trial, you know, patients got into the trial um, because they had ELN-defined resistance or intolerance to hydroxyurea, but it wasn't just based on uh, symptoms uh, from their disease. Splenomegaly, yes, but not the constitutional symptoms. And because it wasn't a blinded trial, as we've said, that the FDA, at least in the United States, would not allow that to be part of the label, that they improve symptoms. But I think we all clearly have the same experience in PV that we do in MF, that symptom control can be quite dramatic with, with um, uh, ruxolitinib and should be considered for those patients. So <clears throat> um, I'm gonna uh, uh, come back to you, Mary Francis, and um, ask, well, so what do you think would be the impact of failing to control the disease on thrombotic events and overall survival? I mean. This is a disease that practicing uh, oncologists see in their clinics all the time. You know, the hematocrit's running a little bit above 45%. I mean, are we doing patients a disservice by not being aggressive in the management of at least the thrombotic risk? What do you think? Well, if we're talking about high-risk patients, and we can have the discussion what constitutes a high-risk patient, but in that group, um, there's clearly evidence that controlling the hematocrit uh, brings about better outcomes. Um, in particular, the CytoPV study showed that a hematocrit be below 0.45 was desirable, um, and that was a good randomised mm -hmm. study. So I think we used this number for many years without that evidence, but we now have, have the evidence of what, um, what level we should be aiming for. And I think you do have to argue that if in the, that's the patient you want the hematocrit below 45%. So how often do you look, though? Well, Monthly, that's true, yes. Three months, yeah. Does it depend on where they are? And where treatment? they are and who, how much the doctor's being paid for the visits. <laughs> if you, you know. well, all important um, issues. Yeah. 
Um, and, and that's certainly an issue because it will vary, you know, does it vary between visits. Um, we would check them frequently at, at the beginning, but once the hematocrit is controlled, then we don't see them, maybe out to every 12 weeks, depending on the practice and, the pa and what they need. So yes, there's probably times that they're up, but then if they're coming back at the 12 weeks, way above, 0.45%, you probably should be seeing them more frequently. But when you first make the diagnosis, I mean, what, what is um, uh, the frequency of your visits? How often, give some guidance to how often do you do phlebotomies to, you know, how aggressive are you in getting that hematocrit down? Somebody who has a very high hematocrit, I would see them weekly. Um, if they're an inpatient and they present with something, you may end up with somebody, say, presenting with a stroke phlebotomizing them every day until you get the hematocrit down. An outpatient I would say weekly until their hematocrit is, is down. Yeah. I, I agree. I'm usually pretty quick on the uptake. If I even, I had a recent experience, just to be totally honest, that I, I, I uh, so I had a patient who had a little bit of a wait time to see me and just a few weeks before she could have a visit, she stroked. Uh, because of a high hematocrit. So more than ever, if the, even the day that I'm seeing them for initial visits, they're going to get that phlebotomy the same day. Um, and depending on the risk factors, potentially start in, in one of those reduction. patients with a high hematocrit too, very obviously. But be, you know. Do we have a subset of patients with an unsolved problem at this point of arterial clots, which happen regardless, regardless of hematocrit, regard and we have no tools to address it, and it's very frustrating if we lose a young patient because of this problem with a mesenteric artery thrombosis or things of that nature, and regretfully it happens. But is that not a slightly different group of patients? We seem to have this group of females presenting with usually spanklic vein events, so very often with only a very low JAK2 mm -hmm. level. You know, there's something different uh, genetically, presumably. We agree, but or we don't have the tools to define no, them. No, no, 